One. You are listening to the MS Power User Podcast. This is episode 37, recorded Thursday, March 2nd. Each week on this podcast, we discuss the latest news about Microsoft, including Office, Xbox, Office 365, Windows Mixed Reality, Office Insider, OneDrive, Skype, Office Online, and of course, Windows. Today, we're going to dig into, well, the stuff I mentioned. We're not really going to have time for much else aside from Satya Nadella's new book. My name is Vernon E. L. Smith, and I'm joined as usual by Andy Bennett. Hi, Andy. Hey, how's it going? There's a lot of stuff today. Oh, Uh, yeah. We've, you know... This is the most packed episode we've had in a while, if not ever. Yeah, well, I don't know how long this episode will be. Obviously, if you're listening, listener, you do know how long it is. So we are... No, 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 don't, don't look at the seek bar. Keep it a surprise. Don't look. <laughs> yeah. Probably too late, but regardless. Yeah. All right. Let's jump right into it. Um, yeah. Weather. Yeah. Well, and I've got weather. Andy's got weather. Okay. Yeah. Uh, intro he, banter. He's, he's got a cold. Yeah. I've got a cold. I mean, you can probably tell that from at least my voice. Maybe not Vernon's. Yeah. So. All right, Andy. New build. What's up? All right. This is build. 15046 and it's a pretty late build as i've been saying for a while we're not going to see any new features in here and uh this is it's a new pc build out on the fast ring right now you probably have it if you're listening to this podcast and you're on the fast ring it should be completely rolled out by now and there isn't too much new in it there's some bug fixes including uh issues for upgrades and whatnot but uh, there's still some actual changes going on, although most of these are really, really small, as to be expected. And one of the biggest ones, yeah, kind of funny, biggest is most noticeable in this case, is uh, the c- color of the Cortana search bar on the taskbar. Now, this has been changed to white for some reason in recent builds, and Microsoft realized, no, people really don't seem to like that. It's go and it's gone back to black, as a uh, as a uh, Donna Sarkar put it when running the post. You had a lot of opinions, and we've been loving the enthusiastic feedback coming in. That sounds tongue in cheek to me. <laughs> it, maybe it's maybe it's just a lot of opinions that, but... and uh, and enthusiastic feedback. Hmm. Mm. But yeah, they but say that's we... part. That's what the Insider program is for. Yep. They say that we finished our experiment with the color of Cortana's home on the taskbar, and for now, it's back to the color it was before. Thanks for your feedback. And there's also some changes to Windows Defender, which is getting... It, it, so actually, just, just a little sidestep here. Windows Defender in general, Microsoft is trying to uh, get sh- get seen more and more as an actual antivirus as opposed to just that thing that's built into Windows, which we saw that with... Uh, uh, well, it was uh, boy. The last release was the anniversary update, wasn't it? Um, uh, I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, last with the anniversary update, uh, you got that little icon that was the little white shield in the taskbar that says PC status protected, and that was done because of a case study that said if you see that little icon there, you feel much safer, or rather, the general user does. So that was kind of the start of this stuff. And with the creators update, we see a brand new Windows, UWP Windows Defender design, which looks much more modern. Like, the current design of Windows Defender is something that I have found insanely bad for years. Like, it looks more like a rogue than a yeah. legitimate program. It's like would... they, they looked at all the, the you know, uh, anti-malware stuff out there, other antivirus stuff, and they said, how can we make this look like that? Only it, they it, did it, it several like, years in the past. Like they were on the lagging oh yeah, edge it's, of it's it. It's obviously a Windows 7 era design. And uh, even then, it still looks like like the design of a rogue, which a rogue is a, pretends to be an antivirus. It's actually yeah. a virus, you know. A little uh, trivia there. And it looks closer to that than anything to me. And it just amazed me how it didn't even look good for Microsoft standards. And uh, with the UWP redesign of Windows Defender, it's looking much, much nicer, as you'd expect. And it's still getting some improvements. 
and it says that and it's called the Windows Defender Security Center and it says it has an added notifi- has added a notification icon to the notification area go figure so you can see your protection status at a glance uh which i guess it's that the win32 version of the app had the icon previously and now they're just bringing it to the UWP version it says you can also launch Windows Defender Security Center uh, right from the settings app and the app and browser page is now functional so that's very very nice I'm really interested in some of the improvements they've been making to Defender, and I really I, I really just want to play around with the UWP app to see how much has changed, although I'm not sure I want to put Insider Builds on my PC just for that. Because, uh, let me, okay, yeah. Getting back to the changes here also. Another Cortana-related thing is pick up I where you I love this left. one. Oh, yeah. Pick up where you left off in Cortana. We're experimenting with how we display what you can pick up where you left off in your, across your devices in Cortana. Cortana now proactively shows you apps, files, and websites from Microsoft Edge. Previously, this feature only displayed websites from Microsoft Edge in Action Center. Let us know what you think. Available in ENUS only. So sorry to all the other languages of the world, including those of you in Britain. In general, I like the concept of picking up where you left off because people, many people have many devices. Well, we're seeing t- two trends where people that are technically savvy do, or technologically savvy, do have multiple devices and they're using them in just different manners, almost small different use case scenarios. But also we're seeing where people are using one device for many things. And that's really not so much in the U.S. necessarily. But uh, you know, my point is that, you know, both Andy and I, we don't have a ton of devices, but we have multiple devices which can run Cortana, which is, of course, is Microsoft's MO. They want to do that. And I love you know, doing something on one device and being able to pick up where I left off, left off on another device. And even this simple fact of, of OneDrive or Office Online, things like that, which um, is almost just a given at this point with cloud, cl- cloud computing. But moving forward, moving further with uh, store, shared or stored favorites in Edge, and especially with Cortana working everywhere, even the little pop up on my PC when my when the, my phone battery is dying, I love that kind of stuff. And this is only going to get better, and I'm only going to get more and more excited about it. This is great. It's, it's kind of funny, really, since uh, I'm kind of in the I like the idea on paper, but I'm not sure how much I'll actually make use of it. Camp, like. For example, you know, with my phone, I do like the idea of having a notification that says my battery is dying, but in my case, I always have my phone right next to me, and even if I'm at my desktop computer, odds are I might have my phone open, I might be taking a look at my email on my phone and quickly reading it there while I'm doing something else on my computer, or maybe I'll check Twitter while I'm doing something productive on my PC. So, like, I'm doing different things on both devices at once, so I always know the status of each other. So it's like, I'm not exactly in the camp that is going to get the most use out of this feature, but I am still very interested in seeing where it goes. It's still obviously early right now, but you have to keep taking those first steps in the right direction to keep, you know, keep putting one foot after the other. Everything's got to start, and this is an interesting one. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then as for the next stuff, there's improved translations for non-English languages. Uh, Let's see, it says... Particularly in the out-of-box experience, there's going to be some improvements, and as well for the newer settings, but there's just also general changes across the system. So they say we encourage you to take a look around the system, and if you spot some, anything that translation, that just doesn't seem on point, please log feedback using the steps provided here, and there's a link. You can go find that in the article we link to. And there's also a updated gaming settings icon, which is pretty close to some of the, the uh, mock-ups I've seen thrown around little backstory on this there is in the creators update there is now a gaming section in the settings app that gaming section has an xbox logo which is sensible of course as microsoft's gaming brand but previously this icon was a totally filled in xbox logo and stood out like a sore thumb among the others now it's a wireframe like all the rest and it looks pretty good and then finally application installation control this has been this has actually been going on for a build or two. Excuse me. It's just that now they are pretty much finalizing it. And as such, they've announced it. Where you can now ch- control what type of apps are allowed to install on your PC. And you can choose, all right, do, can we run anything? 
can we run Win32 apps but display a warning when running them? Excuse me again. Or can we just run UWP apps on this computer? And in this case, say an administrator could lock down a computer so that it can only run apps from the store or apps that are already installed, etc., etc. And it's all made very easy. You don't have to uh, mess around in group policy anymore. So that's nice. This is fantastic. This is something that I will use with my kids for their little consumption devices, uh, watching YouTube on the 8-inch tablet or whatever, uh, as whatever we can see the applications for this not just in an enterprise um, setting but in in a typical a more uh, consumer setting I, this is good yeah there's there's three groups i immediately think of there is the enterprise like you mentioned then there's children like you mentioned and then there's old people i mean uh, there's certain people who where i can see yeah i'll just set up their computer and then i'll uh, lock it down and that's a way that will work out swimmingly i think that's and fair. Yeah, yep. that's pretty much it for when it comes to this build. There's, like I said, there are a bunch of changes, but we're go- that are fixes, of course, and then there's some bugs, but we're not going into them uh, here. You can check out the site if you want to see all that stuff, because at this point it gets to be a lot of the same mundane. Uh, yeah, X Y Z crashed. Here it is. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, we 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 spent may we have spent maybe. 10 minutes going on about Adobe Reader collectively. So, and that was a, boy, that was a while ago, but regardless, yeah. Okay. Andy, let me jump ahead and take the one after this one, and then you, just for the sake of alternating. Um, MWC was recently, okay, (laughs) it happened recently, and there was some cool stuff. Congress. Yeah, it was cool. It's always cool, but there's not a lot of Windows Phone stuff there, really anything, except, well, what we thought might happen is that there might be a a successor to the HP Elite X3, might, you know, just for sake of argument, the X3B or whatever. Well, there was not that. HP did not announce that, but this is very odd. At least in my opinion, they found they saw or PC World noticed this, but the, a concept device behind glass. I mean, it wasn't available to play with of the HP Elite X3 version two, which they weren't calling it something else. They were just saying like an, an alternate version of this, and um, no details were really given of the internals, but the pictures of it, you could definitely tell it was different. I think front-facing camera was in a different spot. The the uh, speaker grill was different. The uh, logo on the back was different. I think that's just what I'm remembering off of from memory there. And this was very interesting. Um, oh, I guess you have it written in here too. Uh, slightly thinner bezels. And uh, yeah, the speakers were offset a little bit. So odd. Uh, I don't know why they're doing that. It's just a little bit head scratchy kind of a thing yeah, i don't think it's much of a head scratcher really i mean it's not necessarily saying yeah we are announcing a new device we are going to display it here it's just okay here's what we're working on right now little, little right now there aren't too many changes but as you can see here's the direction we're going in keep in mind it's a prototype so things might change that's a general vibe i get from this but this is almost literally still the elite x3 I mean, like yeah, it, it's, a, it's, it's it's not like they're going. It's not like you're going to end up with a completely different phone with just this amount of time between it. And plus, there might have been stuff they didn't want to show off. Like for example, it mentions that the uh, the speakers are completely gone there, and it's like, all right, maybe they're working on a new device or not new device, but new component. They aren't necessarily ready to show whatsoever, so that place is intentionally left blank. You know. Perhaps. I think maybe this could also be shifting more towards the the concept of a PC, which iterates very slightly each year, usually. Uh, but they, they can continue to have a new version of it. And maybe that they will continue to call this the Elite X3, just, you know, version 2018 or even 2017 maybe. if they announce it later on. I don't know. I can see how that might be the direction they're going, especially since it is an enterprise device, especially since HP is very, very, uh, they, they sell a lot to enterprise. Who knows? Just, I found it kind of odd and, yeah. um, eh, whatever. I, 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 maybe it's, maybe if it's partially, uh, just because of how, uh, I am used to seeing, uh, certain stuff shown off that 
like uh, pho- phones are a bit of a different world for me when it comes to trade shows and the like. So I'm, I'm just used to seeing that in other industries, I guess. Usually they would try to say something about it, but I'm not. I'm not going to say any more about it. Andy, tell us more about um, the app update situation with the Insider. All stuff. right. So there's been a lot of people noticing lately that you that they are not getting app updates on the fast ring, which is a pretty odd thing. You know, they were thinking, all right, this is the fast ring. We are going to see all sorts of uh, updates for our apps, but no, not the case. There is a reason for this, however, and uh, if and just for the record, you people in the slow ring are still getting their app updates before the rest of the public. Anyways, it's a short-term change that is intentional, and it's done by Microsoft to get ready for the public rollout of the creator's update. And uh, it says that Microsoft needs to make sure that the stock apps will get shipped with the upcoming, that, or rather... The stock apps that will get shipped with the creator's update work as expected out of the box. Not everyone is going to have everything updated and 100% up to date as soon as their computer powers on. But Microsoft still wants it to work when it does. And so this is just a test, you know, to make sure that the, I guess kind of the baseline app is going to work out with the build that they're shipping. And yeah, it's a temporary change. We aren't 100% sure when it will go back, probably after the creator's update is uh, finalized. So maybe whenever we end up with that uh, sweet, sweet RTM or whatever they want us to call it build, then maybe it'll go back then or right after it. So, yeah, who knows? Hmm. That is interesting. Well, another somewhat interesting but much well, quicker. I, mean, I think it's, I think what's interesting there is that I don't think they've tried this before because I don't remember no. seeing any of these complaints uh, with previous uh, batches. So, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I hope I hope the process works out for them. Yeah. Well, moving into services, Skype on Linux, which we kind of forgot about. <laughs> uh, there was a li- a Skype app in alpha build for linux and it has uh, moved forward to beta it's picked up uh, screen sharing and some calling updates and whatever not much more to share about that but it kind of just reminds us that skype is everywhere and that is what microsoft is trying to do even if it means reaching out to linux i think that's kind of cool yeah microsoft's done quite a bit of uh, reaching out to linux although most of that was in the server area Mm -hmm. and uh to my knowledge, Skype for Linux is not something that is very difficult to maintain either. It is closer to a web wrapper than anything, and uh, very easy to port around to other platforms. So it's not like it's... Uh, I think they are they are doing it in a way that is very easy, and they also get... They obviously get more return than what they put in. Even just in goodwill, I think. Oh yeah, for sure. All right, so tell me about Slack. All right, so Slack is in the Windows Store as a Centennial app, and it just got updated recently with improved memory management mainly, and although there's some other changes. And it says, uh, the way we load teams you don't view often has been changed to reduce the app's uh, carbon, or rather, memory. They j- were just joking around. Their memory footprint is changed around. Uh Folks consistently unable to load the app will now be greeted by a troubleshooting page that offers suggestions on making their situation better. And spoiler alert, it's usually to do with overzealous antivirus software. That's interesting. Uh, Those pasting text with style into a post, uh, then finding their text to have no style, can now paste and match style under the edit menu. You can see, okay, you can see help center documentation in the help menu. Go figure. And... There's now spell check for three additional languages, Uh, writers of Korean, Portuguese, and Albanian type. A little easier, it says. Uh, Let's see, they've also fixed some bugs in this update as well, including a handful of Zoom-based glitches. Hmm. So yeah, not not the biggest update in the world, but it's a nice one, and Slack has done a decent job sporting Windows 10, I think. They were one of the first big Centennial apps to get in there, like, after the initial launch of it with uh, Evernote. I think they were one of the first. Mm-hmm. 
All right, to the OneDrive storage saga. And this will have to provide a little bit of backstory here. OneDrive used to be SkyDrive. SkyDrive used to be um, Windows Live Mesh, I think. And I remember using, I guess it, it was, yeah, I think it was Live Mesh. Boy, it must have been 2008 or something like that. And um, just, you know, from a consumer standpoint, I don't even know how I, how that I don't remember. It was very vague, and to be honest, I wasn't very deep into Microsoft at that point, but I used it a little bit. Interesting. Well, point being that if you when you get a Windows phone or if you create a Microsoft account, well, you need a Microsoft account to use a Windows phone or Windows mobile de device. If you create you know, an Outlook.com account or whatever, you get free OneDrive. Well, back in the day, several years ago, when you got OneDrive storage, you got a lot of it. They gave you, I mean... Oodles. And there were too many different uh, storage amounts for me to try to keep track of it. But it used to be you'd get a lot. You know, there was 15 or 30 gigs, and there are a lot of different promos. I know you still get 100 gigs if you have the Groove Music Pass, and there are all types of different promo situations. That's not even for the paid version, just this free OneDrive storage. Well, when Office 365 started rolling around, which is still... I, what was it, half a half a decade ago or whatever when that started rolling out from just business to going to consumer? Yeah, yeah, definitely sound. Yeah, because half a decade ago was yeah two thousand two thousand twelve, and that was Windows eight. So yep, lines up there. And I'm just spitballing here. I'm really bad at at history on this, but when that happened, when you when you purchase an Office three sixty five subscription, whether it's for one year for hundred bucks or or um, the well you can do personal too be the personal or family plan or what do you call it family whatever when you bought office 365 which of course was outlook word excel powerpoint OneNote, whatever you would get onedrive storage and to begin with they said microsoft said it is unlimited and that's insane obviously well uh, some yeah, people the, took the, the that, unlimited storage came in at uh the windows 10 insider preview time so that was October 2015 when it came in as Unlimited. And it was quickly changed, and boy, three three to four months later, it was changed. I well, know it was... It was uh, changed because some Yahoos took that quite literally, which is fine. Microsoft said it, and they decided with their gigabit connection, they are going to upload their entire... I don't know. But everything uh, someone, they hosted. Someone put someone put seventy five terabytes on there. Which so. which actually, I guess that isn't incredibly terrible either. Ter terabyte well, terrible. I mean, it's plenty. It, it's it's incre you know, It's a lot. It get, it gets to be even more when you consider that Microsoft has to back it up because what if one of their servers goes down? Yeah, typically have this have, is covered in three up. at three three or four different data locations, but that can compound, of course. Well, they they saw how the policy could have been abused, and they I would imagine they said, well, well it could have, <laughs> it was, it was. But I mean, from a mass, even if there were, even if there were a thousand people that uploaded seventy three, there could have been more than that, thousand, several thousand, five thousand people that did that. That wasn't going to kill Microsoft. But as we move forward with this, if people say, oh, free storage, um, yeah, I'm putting everything on there. I can see where it could have gotten out of hand. So I understand why they changed it. It was unfortunate that they did. It was really unfortunate that just they, they said unlimited to begin with. So for those people that had used a lot, had already used over a terabyte, you were able to opt in to multiple uh, chunks of 10 terabytes at a time. And now, and they, they had warned us, you know, it's starting to roll back. You're not going to be able to use this. And, uh, you know, you have to trim back to your one terabyte, which is what you get with Office 365. And to be fair, Office 365 Home gets you five users, and each of those users has one terabyte. So you could just pay for, if you need four and a half terabytes of storage, you can just link them all in, in sharing and basically view them. Even now with the new Outlook, the new OneDrive update, you can actually add a shared folder, sh shared uh, yeah folder of OneDrive to your own OneDrive. You just view it that way. Anyway, 
it, you can share very well, and it's it's I, I like that aspect of it, hmm. and uh, and it, it's pretty seamless. But they trimmed it back. They said we're trimming it back. Uh, March first, you got to be under one terabyte. Now it's not entirely clear to me exactly how they're rolling this back, but in the past, how Microsoft has usually done it, if you are over your data storage, they will not delete your data. They will say, um, like say you have um, whatever, uh, 50 or 80 gigs of storage on your Office 365 account and your Office 365 account lapses, you, you, you know, your year ends or whatever, or you stop paying it, they will say you can't access this until you pay up again or if you're over one terabyte, then until you bump up the storage, and you can buy you can buy different chunks of it too. You can buy OneDrive storage separately uh, outside of Office 365 account. I don't remember the pricing on that. I don't so, remember it being too harsh, really. No, not incredibly, but it got a lot worse. It 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 was much less desirable and economical after this change. Before it was ludicrously great, and then both Amazon and uh, Google really, um, and even Dropbox. No, Dropbox is pretty st still pretty expensive, but Amazon um, and uh, Google got much more competitive. Okay. And anyway, um, so they're going to make you pay to get to access it again, or they're going to have you trim it back. You know, obviously. And so that mm -hmm. is uh, unfortunate, right? Yeah, well. And also with that change, they rolled back the the standard or like the the default amount of storage, which was now five gigabytes of storage, and that is as bad as iCloud to put things into perspective. That's the free storage you use with uh, iCloud, and I only have my just a few things backed up with iCloud for my work phone and it's already almost to the to be to be full I don't even have many photos on there so that's kind of a joke um, to put things in perspective I have about I think 118 gigabytes of, of OneDrive used up and of course I have a terabyte I use Office 365 um, I know I went pretty in-depth on that is there any questions you have Andy on this uh, nope Okay. All right. What do we got? Uh, let's see. Next here. All right. So uh, the Xbox. Uh, no, I, I looked at the uh, wrong tab there. My Getting bad. a little jumpy. Yeah. Th th I think that this cold is starting to get to me. Anyways, uh, the Office. There we go. Office Insider. We've got, we've got a couple of sub pages here. And Office Insider is right above Xbox Insider. Uh, but so uh, Office Insider. The Office Insider program has been going since pretty close to the start of the Windows Insider program, if memory serves, and it's got the similar setup. You've got your rings and whatnot, and there's now new updates rolling out to the slow ring. And this is, of course, you know, the Office ring. It's not the same as your Windows ring. You can be a Windows on Windows production builds and still opt into the Office Insider builds, if memory serves. And this has a couple of nice changes in here, like PowerPoint Quick Starter. It says it gives you research ideas and design suggestions for a presentation on a subject of your choosing. Just open the Quick Starter template from File New and specify the subject you want to study. That is pretty huge. PowerPoint has been getting a lot of changes like this over the past couple of years, and I have been in love with so many of them. And this like is I've... one that they had announced, I believe it was at Ignite, which was really exciting. And now we're f finally starting to to see it. Or actually, no, this wasn't Ignite. This was in New York. Um, well, anyway, I I forget. Yeah. I I was there. I remember that part of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, they they have been doing so much stuff lately that it's like they want PowerPoint to work for you. Not it's not just that it's working with you. It is working for you at times. Like for example, you know, it can uh, design a theme around an image you would just insert. Like you can insert an image, and it'll tell you, all right, do you want this as a background? Do you want to insert it into here? You can do that with this theme, and et cetera, et cetera. And I just love stuff like that. It is something that speeds up the workflow so much. And PowerPoint keeps getting better and better with every update. I think. And so yeah, Quick Starter gives you it gives you research ideas for a subject of your choosing as well as design suggestions and it it's 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 a good idea i like it 
And it also says set things straight on devices that have touch touch screens. You can now use the ruler on the draw tab of the ribbon to draw straight lines or to align a set of objects. The ruler pivots to any position you want, horizontal, vertical, or anything in between. It also has a degrees setting so that you can be setting it at a precise angle if necessary. That's this, a nice change. This gives you an excuse to get the surface dial for office. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't seem like it's the same ruler as the uh No, maybe not, one, though. but I think they probably just, you know, carried over the the concept, uh I don't know. Yeah. There's also an enhanced digital writing assistant with additional intelligent services built in that lets editor recognize your words better in context and offer the right spelling suggestions. Look for these improvements in Word and Outlook. I gotta say, I'm actually relatively impressed with the contextual uh, spell check um, and grammar improvement or grammar check the way it is. I I use it quite well. I'm just happy with it. So, but well, it's good. it's always getting better. It's good. Yeah, and also easier background removal for Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Outlook, which let, makes it easier to remove and edit the background of a picture. You'll no longer have to draw a rectangle around the foreground, and instead the app will automatically detect the general background areas. That's cool. You can move pages from side to side, and it says in Word, navigate pages in print layout view by sliding them sli si side to side like a stack of paper. You can try this by clicking view and then side to side. And then from Visio to PowerPoint in a few clicks, it says you can take snippets of a Visio drawing and export them as slides to PowerPoint. That's neat. And also, that's about it. All right. All righty. So we have next, um, oh, more, more uh, uh, office stuff. So editor. Uh, actually, I think that's pretty much what we just uh, covered here. I mean, it was like a condensed version. So uh, whoopsie, we got a double. Well, I think this is being announced. I don't think this is actually there yet. Is that, did I read that it's, right? It's in it's in the the recent slow ring the builds for Office Insider, so it's in. I missed that. All right. Huh. Well, good. Well, one thing that is that um that was announced that is not anywhere yet, as far as I know, is the availability of learning tools. That's what they're calling is this new service. Uh, it's availability to all customers of Office three sixty five or a personal OneDrive account. So when they say personal OneDrive account, I do wonder if that's paid or just means that that is, I mean, because anyone with a Microsoft account has at least five gigs of OneDrive. So that's, I'm not sure about that. Anyway, this is more for, well, I don't know if it's necessarily for re, uh, reading and learning disabilities, but it's just uh, a learning tool. They call it learning tools. So some of the examples would be, uh, features would be to read aloud. It will read text aloud with simultaneous highlighting that improves decoding, fluency, and comprehension while sustaining the reader's focus and attention. Now, I guess to be fair, this could be really good for, for children beginning to read too. I, I don't know. Um, spacing, it's going to optimize font spacing in a narrow column view to improve reading fluency for users who suffer from visual crowding issues, okay? Uh, syllables, it shows the breaks between syllables to enhance word recognition and decoding. I made a point to try to be more uh, clear and, and uh, clear between my syllables as I said that. Uh, parts of speech uh, supports writing instruction and grammar comprehension by identifying verbs, nouns, and adjectives. I really like that, actually. That um, That's interesting. That's cool. So this is, it's cool that it's actually just available to pretty much everyone. I mean, if you are, um, yeah, think of Office 365 as pretty much the baseline thing that most people, you know, earn or pay for through Microsoft, I would think. And especially most people have the home version. Um, is it a family, family version? where uh, Just a personal account? Well, personal is the baseline. Yeah, I'm sorry, but like, the, if you if you pay, pay the extra forty bucks for four more users, um, this is something that my kids, like my four year old, already is set up on my Office 365. He has an Office 365 account. He doesn't do anything with it, obviously, but this is something that could be really helpful to, to uh, people that are 
focused a lot on learning, as in younger people. Huh. Well, that's neat. So, all right, let's. I guess well, I, I think I can, we can do a, an office lightning round. Yeah, and I can run through these two. I typed all these up too. Um, okay, I, and I can zip through them quickly. All so, right. Office 365, I mentioned that already, but uh, Yammer is getting better integration with uh, Office 365. So Yammer itself is, of course, Microsoft's social network for enterprise. So whenever a user creates a new group in Yammer, it will automatically be part of the Office 365 groups service. That's what's changing, the groups part. It's giving It gives the group a OneNote notebook, a uh, planner for task management, uh, and a SharePoint online line, wow, well, SharePoint online team site and document library. Um, I don't know too much about SharePoint online team site and what have you, but um, that is interesting how it's integrating it together and it just automatically sets you up with uh, uh, Office 365 group. All right. Um, this is an interesting one. Russia's largest social network. Um, the contacty okay you can just call it vk vk is how it yeah as normally known as which of course means in contact um it uh, receives office 365 integration well first about vk i looked up because obviously i this is not something i'm very familiar with it was founded in 2006 currently has 410 million users and um Apparently, their rules about pornography are less stringent than uh, we would normally see in the U.S., which uh, is, uh, well, whatever. Basically, this integration, this Office 365 integration, means that users do not need to store their Office documents locally, like on their phone or the PC, but they can be viewed, on, viewed online through the Office Online Viewer through the social network. So think of it this way. If you go out to grandma's house and uh, they, you know, the, oh, I want to see pictures of your whatever, your thing, your dog or your hiking trip or whatever, instead of storing them, the pictures on your phone, you would just pull up Facebook and say, hey, here they are all right there. Oh, yeah, I don't have that their Facebook thing. I'm glad you could just show it to me. Well, the same thing is goes for documents. And I guess I don't know how many you know how prevalent uh, documents uh, being stored on a social network it, uh, you know i can't really quite envision that application that much but maybe resumes and cvs and things like that whatever hmm. anyway lastly here as far as office 365 i, I just want to interrupt and okay. say that on the subject of vk the issue here is that you said you said grandma instead of babushka oh i hope i said that i apologize yeah <laughs> So Office 365 Service Health Dashboard is now available for customers. Uh, so this is Office 365 Enterprise, basically, and it, as I understand it, and it has absolutely nothing to do with your health. It's not like Microsoft Health or Band or Health Vault or whatever. It, as I understand it, it's basically monitoring the health of the Office 365 service that users are receiving. And it basically breaks it down between two different categories um, considered incidents and advisories. So I guess in a way, just being really ignorant about this type of stuff, I would lump this into the Windows Defender category of all, all of that very broadly. Um, I... I'm really making a fool of myself because I don't understand this well enough. But it has nothing to do with your physical health. It has to do with the health of, I guess, <laughs> the users. Mm, I, I, I don't know. The health of the service. Where, the service, yeah. Uh, there is a siren right now as a uh, presumably either a fire truck or an ambulance goes by. So uh, there's the explanation for that sound. Okay. Anyways... All right, moving on to some yeah. holographic stuff, which is this no is, longer this holographic. This is the stuff that we can both talk about. Yeah. Right, so the, I think I'll take the first one here, mm -hmm. exercise my voice a bit more. The biggest thing is that it's no longer Windows holographic. Surprise, surprise. It is a, kind of a silent cha name change here. Windows Mixed Reality, which is more encompassing of the company's broader vision for the platform. 
because just like how uh, Microsoft uh, displayed over, boy, I th I forget where it was, but uh, th they they announced uh, not just holographic headsets like you know uh, the oh boy Hololens. That's it. There we go. Not just like the Hololens. They also have some full VR headsets that they showed off. And those are pretty neat looking. They announced partnerships with some companies that showed off some very nice budget headsets. And they're both going to have, and they're going to have the same platform for both augmented reality and full virtual reality. So it's, they call this Windows Mixed Reality. That, Basically that, for the, the HMDs, the head mounted displays is what the, this is focused on, and they have a lot of different OEMs that have these, obviously, are rolling out, can be increasingly so. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's that's a, it's a, it's a subtle brand change. This, everything is still in pre-production, so that's nice. Yeah. And to be honest, I, I do like the change, even though it has windows in front of it. I think mixed reality, for one, it, it definitely describes it better. Yeah, uh, when I think holograms, I don't think uh, something on a visor. I think actual projection. Yeah, Ho Windows, Microsoft Holographic, or was it? My, well, Windows. Uh, it was Windows. Windows it was. It was yeah. still Windows Holographic. So it was just a, a dated, dated uh, term, and I didn't really like it. It did describe to some extent what it was, but mixed reality. I think now that people understand what that is, and uh, as, as virtual reality and augmented reality become more uh, mainstream terms. Mixed reality is a, the best. I'm glad that they grabbed that. It's almost like Apple taking, um, they they just use such generic terms for things and they somehow my brand favorite is it. Still, hey, my favorite is still Apple Pay because that's what they want you to do. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, so I like this move. It's wise, except for the Windows part of it at the beginning. But that doesn't really... Yeah, it's fine. It's it's tied to Windows devices. You'll see it on stuff like the uh, Xbox One, which, spoiler alert for upcoming stories, uh, you've got it on, of course, you know, Windows PCs connected to VR headsets. You have HoloLens, which is a Windows device running U UWP apps. So I'd say it all ties in together under the Windows branch. You're not going to find this stuff on Linux. Mm -hmm. Well, you might as well finish with that there, the next story. All right. Yeah. Okay. And so, then I'll hit the other one. Okay. And so something that uh, is a little bridge here between two sections and something that was kind of a soft announcement is that Microsoft is bringing mixed reality content to Project Scorpio and the Xbox One in 2018, uh, which makes sense as Scorpio itself is currently slated for a December 2017 launch. So in the coming year afterwards, we'll start seeing virtual reality or mixed reality content heading over, presumably with a headset that you connect to the Xbox One Scorpio unit. We don't know its final name, of course. And yeah, it's probably going to be a competitor to PlayStation VR, as the Xbox One is very much a gaming device, no matter what name they slap on it, that's going to remain its primary, fo primary focus. And yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see. We don't really have many details on it. And again, this was kind of a soft announcement, something that we've kind of known for a while, as they said that Scorpio was going to be a VR-capable machine. It was designed with VR in mind. So not the most surprising thing in the world, but it's nice. It also means that you're probably going to see your UWP apps show up on there in holographic as well. So not just games, even if they are likely the focus. Mm-hmm. And in the spirit of pre preparing for things coming down the pike in the future, the Windows 10 Movies and TV app is now getting support for 360-degree videos. Uh, it's coming with the, the Creators Update coming out later this year, available to, uh, you know, consumers or, you know, m public uh, this year. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, pretty obvious what that's for. Especially as a, the budget headsets they announced, I'm pretty sure they're slated for either this year or the next in the second half of... second half of this year is the earliest, I think. I don't know if that was officially mentioned or not, but I'm pretty sure that's what they're aiming for. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I would imagine so. So that's nice to see that rolling out too. Or I don't know when it's coming, but it's pretty soon. Uh, no, All is righty. it is it available? Let's see. What oh, is getting support? Yeah. Well, anyway, it's coming. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's available in an update uh, that I think is in preview now. Anyways, we got some interesting to... Xbox oh, stuff, yeah. which I will continue. Yeah, the rest to. of the show is it's all full Andy Xbox except stuff. when I interrupt him. So go for it. Yeah, this is an interesting thing. Now, uh, the game developer conference GDC is going on right now and that microsoft has brought some very interesting t- announcements to the table alongside it and the uh, biggest one i think is the xbox live creators program now if anyone here listening has had an xbox 360 the odds are you know about or at least have heard of even if you don't have an xbox 360 the xbox live indie game section This was a dedicated section of the store for indie developers where they could support their games in there, and every single game in that store was made with Microsoft's XNA framework, and it was a way that not only got some people to get their uh, feet in the water with getting their games published on a store, it also got Microsoft a very good way to get developers using XNA. That was a, and that was a way to, you know, push that along very well. Issues arose really with quality control and the if a memory serves, Microsoft specifically said they were going to shut that store down at one point, although the plans never really went through as it's still up to this day. But it was a very, it was hardly moderated, got filled to the brim with junk, and just in general, even though there were some gems in there that I'm glad happened, and I'm glad the section existed because of that, I think it's safe to deem it as not quite what Microsoft was hoping for. Xbox Live Creators Program is, I don't want to say it's the same because it's, because we have yet to see if, how, or rather, how it's going to be moderated in practice, and I do think they will employ a bit heavier moderation to it than they did with uh, the Xbox Live Indie Game section, and that was really the main issue. Once you get past that hurdle, it's a brilliant idea, and it's a way to, that makes it significantly easier for developers to get their games on the Xbox One and Windows 10. You have a simplified certification process without any required concept approval, and you can even integrate to almost every area of Xbox Live with the exception of achievements in multiplayer. And then here's where some more of the similarities to the indie games approach comes in. This has to be a UWP game, similar to how, like I said, you know, previously had to use XNA framework. And that's, it's obvious what that is for. It's the same kind of idea. Get developers working with UWP. And it gives them incentive. They can easily get their game in a store. And speaking of when they get in the store, on the Xbox One, at the very least, creators program games will have their very own creator section. And on the Windows 10 store, they'll be displayed alongside every other game. But again, we're seeing more and more parallels here. It is almost identical from what I am seeing to the old Xbox Live Indie Games approach, although it is, of course, changed to fit modern Microsoft's goals. And one of those that I'm seeing is that it seems like it is designed to get a lot more games in the Windows Store, which a lot of critics currently say is lacking titles, and to be quite honest here, they are often right. A lot of the titles in the Windows Store are mobile-focused at the moment and designed with with the idea of being cross-platform in a sense of mobile-first, PC port. This is this lets this will get a lot of games in the Windows Store that are developed with uh, the mon- mindset of potentially console first PC port or the other way around. But thing is, the difference between console and PC is nowhere near. I mean, when it comes to how you design a game, designing a game for a console and PC is pretty much identical anymore. You aren't going to have that insane gap like you do with uh, mobile and PC because you have to design for touch controls. And this is something that's going to get a lot of titles on the Windows Store, and if the and if things are moderated well enough, it's going to get a lot of quality titles on the Windows Store. So yeah, uh, Vernon, what do you think about this? I hope I explained it well enough. As, uh, you just woke yeah. me up by asking me. No, I oh. I, <laughs> I was actually reading a bit ahead. I'm much more excited about the next article here, and. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think it's really good, the, the integration with, you know, X, with Xbox Live, and I, I don't really, I don't have a strong enough opinion on it, sorry. 
Okay. Okay. Then. Well, that works out. Sorry to yeah. disappoint you. <laughs> yeah, this is it, it's either going to be a great idea or a repeat of an approach that was pretty mixed reception. And I hope I hope it works out well. I hope they don't repeat the same mistakes. In fact, the reason I'm saying the old one was a mistake is because I don't want them to repeat it. And yeah, if done if done well, is going to be a great boost to both the Windows Store and the Xbox Store as well as you're going to see plenty of neat little varied titles in there, hopefully. All right, the next one, which Vernon was reading up on, I think, is the Xbox Game Pass, a new subscription service that is coming this spring. And this is a neat And idea. it's already pretty much spring. It's coming quick, apparently. Oh, yeah. That's, and this yeah. is likely going to launch with the next update to the Xbox One, rather a dashboard update as we might have a couple of little bug fix updates in between. There used to be a couple of those. But the next big update with changes to the dashboard is going to bring this one in. At least, that's the way it seems, as it's currently in Insider Builds. But it's basically Netflix for games. For 10 bucks a month, you get access to 100 or more, give or take, a, give or take like, say, maybe five at most, as games will switch in and out of the service. And it's not a replacement for games with gold. It's a temporary temporary in the sense that if you are done subscribing to Xbox Game Pass, you do not have access to any of those games. But if you subscribe to Xbox Game Pass, you will gain a new little icon in the membership section, which is coming with the next dashboard update, that, that, gets, that gives you access to that full library of 100 or so games. And you can go in there, you can look around, you can download. This is not streaming like PlayStation Now. It is a full download of the game to your Xbox One's hard drive. You can play it just as if it was any other game you had and just go about playing it. And this is a very nice approach. It's basically an expanded, much expanded version of EA Access, and it does come with deals as well. You will get a uh, discount on any game participating in the program. So if you decide, all right, I like this program, I guess. I like some of the games in here, I guess, but I particularly like three, four, five games. I want to buy them, and then I'm just going to stop subscribing to the service and be done with it. I'm glad it introduced me to all this stuff. You can get those games for a cheaper price, and that's nice. I... It also saves you for if, say, the game leaves the service, you still have it. Mm -hmm. I love this. I think this is so fantastic. Just like if you compare it to Netflix, Netflix is enormous right now and it's we're just really entering in the grand scheme of things we're just entering the big the major streaming uh era where we've had we still have cable and satellite and that's still such a um a much less on demand and more broadcast where netflix of course is is very on demand and i you know 10 bucks a month for this is um fantastic i mean it's a great price oh, yeah. obviously i mean that's uh, the way, 120 the way bucks would... a year i mean that's that's too top not two two high-end games maybe four games depending on uh on the yeah. cheap games yeah if you're buying games at launch then it's it's and assuming you don't get any nice discounts it's 60 bucks at launch for triple a titles so yeah mm -hmm. you definitely do save quite a bit with this so this and is the way gonna... i would see it if uh like, for example, if I was just buying my Xbox One, say, let's say I never got my Xbox One. Let's say I had no games at all. This was a fresh start for me. I was buying an Xbox One, say, summer of 17. I'd bu I'd probably buy the Xbox One, and then I would probably just sign up to that service to get access to some games quick as I built up my library. It's And it's really great for all sorts of situations like that because, you know, previously I I would buy a system. I'd probably have maybe one game for maybe a month because obviously I had to recoup the costs of the system itself. This, not so much. That's nice. And I think it's going to be really good for people that are, are less um, adamant about gaming to have an Xbox maybe just for, um, you know, media consumption, for example, or, you know, streaming Netflix, what have you. And this I don't is, think, I don't think, I don't think that's the majority of people, but you know, well, that would be me, but then again, I don't actually have an Xbox yet, you know, some yeah. someday. But I th I think that even for more casual gaming where it's like, yeah, I'm not going to spring 30 bucks for that or I don't really it's not worth it for me to try it out. Like I can really see how someone 
gaming will we'll get a game and then really regret it but we'll try to play it play through it just because they spent 40 bucks on it it's like well i better finish yeah. it up uh this get my money's worth this is significantly cheaper than rental services too and you get better and better deal for it you know like maybe it's 14 bucks for a weekend with gamefly or whatever i don't know their current rates but 10 bucks for a month and you get 100 games included in there that's great. Mm -hmm. This is really, really good for the consumer, but I love what Microsoft has been doing. Basically, it started with Office 365, where they're doing these uh, services. And it's it's a continuous revenue stream. It's something that the shareholders really like to see. Uh, it's something that gets people pulled in and hooked. And I can easily see how I would become one of those people. 120 bucks a year isn't too bad but when but um you know it's 120 bucks more a year than i would have been spending on microsoft to begin with and the thing is that it's microsoft is getting a much slicer uh rev a much slicer well much bigger slice <laughs> of the revenue i think where of course they do need to rent you know pay the game makers for these the game studios but um I don't know. Yeah, Netflix uh, has really worked well, and I can see how this could work really well. And it's yeah. awesome that they did it before Sony or Nintendo did it. Well, actually, Sony actually do, did have PlayStation Now, which is uh, game streaming. It's Netflix for games in the sense that you are actually streaming your games as well. And I do believe we talked about it previously when they brought it to Windows, and that was boy, that was July or something last year, and it was. It's a decent enough surface, I guess, but it was brought down by the quality of its apps and also the performance issues that it often had. You, there is nothing quite like having a game actually running on your hardware, and that is the optimal situation. There's really no want to stream unless you're streaming, say, from the, from a system in your house to another device in your house, and that's probably the best you'll get. And even then, that's, that's still got some issues. Mm -hmm. I love and, this. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's basically. In fact, I even I do think that it was Mike Ibarra, also known as Quick, who said that uh, he he didn't just flat out say that they tried streaming, but he said that uh, streaming would not provide the optimal experience, and it was worded in a way that made it seem to me like they did initially consider streaming potentially because of uh, stuff like PlayStation Now, and so yeah, that's it's it's far better. Our really? internet connections are not good enough yet. Not necessarily the the, the wait, speed wait, wait, itself, wait, 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 but wait. I mean the oh, but the oh, we're not switching topics. Okay, yeah, I got I I I initially thought that was a topic switch for a second. <laughs> Sorry, it, it, no worries. I don't think that internet the standard internet connection is not good enough yet for true streaming of this type of stuff. Um, I well, my opinion, I guess latency just yeah. isn't quite there yet. Yeah, Low and latency, even if it's not just say. latency, even if it's not latency, there is also picture quality to take into account. Okay, yeah. And then also the final note on this is that Xbox Insiders and the Alpha Ring are currently able to test this out with a limited number of games. And it's not the full list, of course. It's a preview. And we're, we don't know if any of these will be in the final thing, but there's stuff like uh, Banjo... A lot of these are stuff in the Rare Replay library. Like Banjo-Kazooie, Cameo, Jetpack Refueled... Then there's also some stuff like Gears of War Judgment, the Gears of War Ultimate Edition, mostly Xbox 360 games in here, surprisingly, which is worth noting that the Xbox 360 games in this program do only work on the Xbox One. You're not going to be playing these on the 360 if you're in here. It is Xbox One only, even if they're backward compatible. So that's worth noting. And yeah, overall, it's probably the best, one of the best ideas Microsoft has, has had for an Xbox One feature there. And I, and I let, I let, maybe not best idea, I don't know, but uh, like best implementation at the very least. Well, it isn't actually it's, implemented yet, but it really it, it does is. sound. It is, in pre, it is in preview builds. But we don't, yeah, we don't see how, no one's telling us how well it's working. We just see. Well, yeah. it's, it's a, it runs off systems that they already have and have had for years, like EA Access, which is Electronic Arts Games. And that is five bucks a month, I think, for EA catalog and uh, discounts on some of their newer titles as well and previews of stuff. 
and it was, I, th I guess it was really almost only a matter of time. This is, so this is tech that Microsoft has had kicking around for some time now, and so they're just putting it to use on a broader range. So yeah, I mean, it is just basically you download that game to your system, it runs just like it would, if, as if you bought it digitally. Because technically, you did buy it digitally, you have the license for it, it's just that that license will expire once you stop paying every month. All right. And moving on, Battlefield 1 heads to Xbox Live Gold's free play days this weekend. If you have Xbox Live Gold, there's occasionally times where you'll get to play a game for free over the weekend. This time it's Battlefield 1, which if you end up liking that, and keep in mind, free play days are the full game, it's 50% off, so if you play it over the weekend, and the free play days will start probably a little bit before this podcast gets uploaded and ends on Sunday night. Uh, yeah, you get to join in, play Battlefield 1. If you like it, it's currently 50% off and deals with gold. So, yeah. Cool. All righty. Well, we are nearing the time when we would normally be done, but there's a couple more feel-good items coming up here I want to uh, just share quickly. Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, uh, as I actually alluded to in the in the intro, has a book which is uh, not quite out yet, but it is it is coming out. It's called Hit Refresh. I obviously don't know anything about it. I haven't really read it. You know, I haven't read it obviously, but it's a book by Microsoft CEO Satya. We know he's really refreshed Microsoft. Uh, I mean, it's just a drastic change, and not saying that some of that wasn't already in play before Ballmer stepped down, but this. Uh, I'm sure it'll be pretty interesting and go on. I'm sure it's on Amazon or whatever. Go to this, go to our uh, mspoweruser.com to uh, find the link. And also Microsoft employees have raised $142 million, uh, which have gone to 19,000 nonprofits around the world. And I think it's only been about a year since they have done this officially through, uh, what is it they're calling it? I guess I better actually look it up, but, um, this this program that they have uh am stalling let's see oh microsoft uh, well, philanthropies microsoft philanthropies formed just over a year ago they said so um not only the, are they donating a lot of cash um but it's also cloud services and software and things like that to um different different things i'm looking at the wrong numbers here let's see Oh, I'm sorry. Microsoft no. employees, the $142 million that's donated by the employees themselves. And of course, Microsoft has donated um, $650 million, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, a lot of money. We get it. So nice stuff. And it says actually here that Microsoft has that in their giving program, they've raised one and a half billion dollars since 1983. That's pretty fantastic. And one thing I just want to note on this too is that I love when a company, uh, when a company gives, you know, philanthropically when they donate to nonprofits, because, well, for one, I mean they're not paying tax on it, and that's fine. That's a wise move from a company. But it's it's great that they are helping support those people or entities in need. And that's that's a great way to do it. In contrast, that's better, in my opinion, than the government taking our tax money and giving it to where to to entities that are most likely lobbying, probably paying someone to go bother the government to get money from them. I would much rather it be direct from a company or especially an individual, as opposed to it going through the government uh, and taxes and that type of thing so big great big kudos to microsoft for doing this i love that they are that they're doing that fantastic and yippee kaye and all that um i think we're done andy got yeah. anything to add anything to finish uh, us with hot, hot take that's very controversial Charity's good that's all okay i yeah all right well thanks for listening to the podcast everyone <laughs> i do appreciate it uh, Andy, of course, does as well. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at MSPowerUser. Go to the site, MSPowerUser.com. 
you subscribe to our podcast, please. That way we will be right there in your podcast aggregator as soon as the new latest episode is available, which is almost always every Friday morning. Andy and team does a great job with that. I, if you feel compelled to interact with us individually, I am on Twitter at Vernon EL and Andy is on Twitter at FusionFan45. That's it. Uh, that was a that was a fun episode. We crammed a lot oh, yeah, in that, there. That, that, it was a packed one. This is, you know, it's funny. You know, Microsoft had the work and play bundle. This is basically the work and play episode. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah, off a lot of Office three sixty five and Office um, stuff, OneDrive, and then of course lots of uh, fantastic Xbox stuff, which I stayed awake for. I really liked it. It's good. Alrighty. All right, that's it. Everyone have a great week. Take care. Bye.